today's topic is osteoarthritis and we will be discussing the second part of this osteoarthritis which includes how to examine the patient clinically how to diagnose it and what are the different aspects of the treatment let us start with the history taking is very important in the history taking for the osteoarthritis to be diagnosed you have to prove that the progression is slow it takes several years or maybe decades to have a full fledged osteoarthritis in the patient and in those course of the period the patient can become slowly less and less active his physical activity is decreased and there is always a chance of him getting weight and even if sometimes patient does not complain to the doctor or appears everything is normal the gait may be antalgic in the weight bearing joints and of course the pain is the primary symptom that brings the patient to the doctor and the quality of the pain is deep achy joint pain and it exacerbated by extensive use there is a reduced range of motion and when the knee moves there is a crepitus felt the patient may tell you and the stiffness during the rest may occur this is called gelling phenomenon morning stiffness usually lasts less than 30 minutes we must differentiate it from the rheumatoid arthritis where the stiffness lasts usually more than 1 hour so there are more relevant points to be taken in the history so apart from the routine questionnaire what are those points that will be taking in the case of primary osteoarthritis so duration of the problem we have just seen it is very long we have to ask the patient any history of injury if there is a history of injury probably it may be a secondary osteoarthritis we must ask the patient about his difficulty in squatting or negotiating a staircase and stiffness that we have already discussed we must rule out rheumatoid arthritis and the way to rule out is we must ask for the duration of the morning stiffness in rheumatoid arthritis it usually lasts more than 1 hour in rheumatoid arthritis there is involvement of smaller joints and swelling usually comes first than the pain and usually it is bilaterally symmetrical episodic onset especially in the mp joint with signs of inflammation of the great toe it is to rule out the gouty arthritis and to rule out the tuberculosis we must take the history of evening rise of temperature loss of appetite loss of weight and there will be locally cross muscle wasting that patient can tell to the doctor the clinical features pain is the earliest symptom to come it is usually intermittent initially more severe on the weight bearing and it decreases with the rest but ultimately it becomes constant and pain is present even at the rest in late cases the swelling is due to increased synovial fluid in the joint and activity of the joint induces swelling there is morning stiffness lasting less than 30 minutes and deformity which is present is usually various deformity and there may be instability there may be locking or the patient may tell the, to the doctor the catching sensation crackling sound or the crepitus from the knee on movement and gait is antalgic now why is there a locking of the joint it is due to the torn meniscus due to the loose body is getting cut between the articular surfaces on general examination one must see the 
abundance nodes and the voucher nodes. Abundance nodes are seen at the DIP joint. You can see my cursor, it is here in the DIP joint. This is called abundance nodes. And in the proximal interphalangeal joint, it's called vouchers nodes. And also take the patient's weight and BMI. When we start the examination on inspection, one must rule out whether there is a fixed flexion deformity or the knee is extended. The swelling has to be noted and it has to be differentiated from effusion or there is a bursal swelling. Effusion will be known by looking at the parapatellar fullness. There may be a case where there is a Baker cyst in the popliteal fossa. It is communicating with the joint. And there may be bursal swellings, which are mostly pre patellar or the infrapatellar bursitis. The deformity usually varies, but sometimes can be valgus as well. And most of the time, there will be quadriceps vesting if it is unilaterally present. And usually, there is no limb length discrepancy. On the palpation, temperature is usually normal. Tenderness is felt on the joint line and sometimes retropatellar tenderness when the patellofemoral joint is also involved. Swelling or effusion has to be confirmed it is the parapatellar depression is usually full and it means there is an intraarticular swelling. And when the intraarticular swelling is more, it can be seen in the suprapatellar bursa as well. The Baker cyst is confirmed in the popliteal fossa. Deformity is confirmed. Cryptus on movement is confirmed. And usually, there will be irregular bony surfaces of the tibia and femur near the articular margins. And it is due to the osteophyte formation. What is of vesting? will be confirmed and in many times in very late cases subluxation can be palpated. Movement is usually painful towards the extremes and it is usually associated with the crepitus and the type of the crepitus can be fine in the early stasis and becomes coarse in advanced stasis. Special tests is to be done for the effusion they are the patellar tap test, fluid shift test, and cross fluctuation test. When the patellar femoral joint is involved, the patellar grinding test is positive. And when the ligaments are lax, one has to do various valgus stress test, and rarely maybe needed latchman and anterior draw test. And when there is a history of locking, it is to be confirmed by McMurray's test. So ACR guidelines for ONE has been given. There are nine parts of it along with the pain. So pain in the knee is the basic fundamental part of the ACR guideline. And along with the pain in the knee, there may be any three of the following nine. Patient over the age of 50 years, the less than 30 minutes of morning stiffness, crepitus on the movement, joint line tenderness, bony enlargement, no warmth of synovian or palpation, ESR less than 40 millimeter per hour, rheumatoid fracture is in the ratio of 1 is to 40, synovial fluid analysis is typical of that of OA. So any three of these nine along with the pain in the knee confirms clinically that we are dealing with the is of osteoarthritis of the knee. The differential diagnosis is to be made with the rheumatoid arthritis, tuberculous arthritis, septic arthritis, hemophilic arthritis, reactive arthritis, and a few cases of spondyloarthropathies. The lab studies are usually of hardly any value. The diagnosis is based mainly on the clinical and radiographic evidence. ESR is usually not elevated and synovial analysis is a typical of OAA. We'll find the WBC count will be less than 2000 and there will be mononuclear predominance in it. 
there is no single biomarker which has proved reliable for diagnosis. Plain X-ray is the imaging method of the choice. Decreased joint space, mostly on the medial joint space it is seen. The osteophytes at the articular margins is seen. Subchondral sclerosis, usually on the pressurized side. And subchondral cysts, various deformity and sometimes loose bodies can be seen. So we can see it here. This is the medial joint space is almost nil and then there is a osteophyte formation at end here, here, along the cursor and there is subchondral sclerosis is seen here and there is cystic, cyst is there a cyst here, subchondral cyst. And this is osteophyte again, osteophyte again. So these are the findings that you usually see in the osteoarthritis. Should we do the CT? It is not used. Neither the MRI is necessary for the most of the patients. Ultrasonography has got hardly any role in clinical assessment except for the guided injections of the joints, which are not easily accessed. And arthrocentesis is usually to distinguish between non-inflammatory and inflammatory arthritis. And when we do arthrocentesis, we do the gram stain and culture, as well as we prove that there is absence of crystals there. There is a grading system based on the X-rays. It is Kelgren Lawrence grading scale, grade zero to grade four. Grade zero means there is no radiographic feature of OA at all. Grade one is joint space narrowing is doubtful, but possible osteophyte leaping. There is a possibility there. The grade two is osteophytes are now definitely seen and possibly joint space narrowing, especially on AP weight bearing radiographs. Grade three is multiple osteophytes and definite joint space narrowing and all the features will come along, along with it. That is sclerosis, possible bony deformity, maybe, but in grade four, the definite bony deformity comes along with all the other features. The treatment, the principle is delay the occurrence, decrease the progress, delay the need for surgery, and do the surgery in late cases for decreasing the disability of the patient. There are some non-pharmacological measures that can be taken, and it is usually said to be the lifestyle modification. So avoiding aggravating stress to the affected joint and reducing the weight. Somebody may get relief with the local heat or some may get relief with the ice. Reduction of the cartilage impact loading can be done with the help of cane, rubber heel vases, usually don't give much relief. Consider lateral is in the medial compartment of this. Non-pharmacological measures can be done with the physiotherapy and tense transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation can be done and electromagnetic field stimulation can be done. This electromagnetic field stimulation has been approved by US FDA for use in patients with osteoarthritis of the knee. There can be some supportive measures and usually avoid running or prolonged standing, prolonged walking, sitting cross-legged, squatting and kneeling down. An exercise is one of the most beneficial features that can be done. And how it acts, it builds the muscles around the joint, it decreases the stress on the joint, and it adds stability to the joint. Medications can be given, especially in the form of painkillers. There is some inflammation present, and so many people advocate use of NSAID 
initially for a few days or a week and then go to the pure analgesics. If you want to give the NSAID, it is cyclooxygenase 2 or COX-2 is the best one. Out of COX-2, celecoxib and etericoxib are best suited for the patient. Topical capsaicin can be given as a counter irritant and sometimes topical non steroid anti-inflammatory drugs can be given. There are some fascinating studies on painkillers and it has been done by Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Findings. It has been found that extra immunophen was modestly inferior to NSAID in reducing pain, but was associated with a lower risk of gastrointestinal adverse effects. Also, estaminophen poses a higher risk of liver injuries that should be kept in mind. There are more studies. The selective NSAID or COX-2 inhibitors, they have lower risk of ulcers compared to NSAID. The gastrointestinal adverse effects are higher with the naproxen than with the ibuprofen. Celecoxib and ibuprofen and diclofenac were associated with increased risk of cardiovascular adverse effects when we compare with the placebo and ibuprofen and diclofenac, but not naproxen were associated with increased risk of heart attack when compared with the placebo. So choose your painkillers very wisely. Also, it has been a very fascinating to note that the topical diclofenac was found to have the efficacy to that of the oral NSAID. So it is almost the same. All NSAID has deleterious effects on blood pressure, edema and the kidney function. So that part should be remembered. Is there any possibility of the mortality when we are giving the analgesics? And some researchers have found the relation of possible mortality with the use of tramadol. Tramadol appears to be associated with the higher mortality risk among older patients. And they have seen in one year follow up 71% higher risk of the mortality with use of tramadol. So that should be kept in mind. There are some disease modifying osteoarthritic drugs, which is chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine. They elicit an anti-inflammatory effect at the synovial membrane and chondrocyte levels. Chondroitin sulfate is supposed to be good for finger joint OA and they have better effect on Hubbard's and the Boucher's nodes. DMOAD, disease modifying osteoarthritic drugs, have focused primarily on preventing hyaline cartilage loss, and that's why they are called chondroprotective agents. Remember, the glucosamine is an amino sugar, but evidence is insufficient to determine whether its use leads to change in glucose metabolism or glycemic control. And if the patient is allergic to the shellfish, the glucosamine should not be given. There are some intra-articular injection and they are, one is the visco supplementation, injection hyaluron, intra-articular steroid injections, and platelet-rich plasma injections, all are given intra-articularly. ACI recommendation for the new OA is you will start with the estaminophen, oral nasards, topical nasards, tramadol, intra-articular corticosteroid injections. What are the complications of intra-articular steroid injections? It can be local, can be systemic. So local complication may cause fat necrosis and loss of skin pigmentation in the blacks. And that looks ugly. In some cases, it may accelerate the joint degeneration. Joint becomes like a charcoal joint. And systemic absorption sometimes can happen 
of course it depends upon the different preparations and the doses so preparation if it is water soluble the absorption is more the dose if it is more the systemic absorption will happen if you give in the multiple joints systemic absorption can be more and then it can cause transient hyperglycemia in diabetic patients and can cause avascular necrosis of the femoral head in a rare complication and there can be of course iatrogenic septic arthritis though it is rare but there is a possibility that it can happen how many times in a year an intraarticular steroid injection can be given or should be recommended usual recommendation is no more than 3 injections per year is to be given to a particular joint the acr guidelines on the glucosamine and chondroitin they clearly says that it is not to recommend chondroitin or glucosamine for the initial treatment of osteoarthritis but the patients who have already started it or may have felt benefit they can keep on taking it they are safe in the long term surgical treatment there are different surgical treatments one is the corrective osteotomy could be arthroscopic joint debridement the third could be the arthroplasty in arthroplasty it could be the total joint or the unicompartmental joint replacement and there can be arthrodesis so corrective osteotomy is suited for the young patients where there is one compartment is intact an arthroscopic joint debridement when there is loose bodies that has been found on x rays or there is a history of locking total joint replacement when all the three compartments are involved when whole of the cartilage of both compartments is denuded patient is more than 65 years of age unique compartmental joint replacement is recommended when there is a total loss of cartilage in that particular compartment arthrodesis usually is not recommended nowadays in major joints but it is still suitable for the carpo metacarpal joint of the thumb that is also called basilar thumb arthritis so arthroscopic joint debridement gives symptomatic relief by removing the torn meniscus loose body and small cartilaginous flecks so let us see the advantages of the corrective osteotomy and what are the disadvantages advantages of the corrective osteotomy are it redistributes the weight bearing load it function is better because it is normal it is patient's own joint and there is no life of it like arthroplasty implant it is recommended in younger patients with intact one compartment cartilage the disadvantages are pain relief is not so good as in arthroplasty and recovery is slower and physiotherapy is longer so it is not usually advised in old days so advantages and disadvantages of the total joint replacement advantages are complete pain relief focus and the patient can be mobilized quickly the disadvantages are it has to be done in old days because there is a life of each implant it is usually recommended only after 65 years of age to avoid the second rearthroplasty and the function of the joint is limited arthrodesis of the knee not a primary option rarely done nowadays it is indicated in the rare instances when there is infected total knee arthroplasty or the failed prosthetic knee replacement there is a deficient extensor mechanism there there is poor soft tissue coverage in young age with high functional demand or when the socio economic condition is not so good what is gained is pain factor is removed 
but we gain stability at the cost of mobility. So here you can see the cartilage has been removed, tibia and femur has been fixed by a plate or maybe fixed by a nail also and sometimes by an external fixator. Now let us see what is new in osteoarthritis. Why newer approach is needed? So far, only treatments for the osteoarthritis are pain control and total joint replacements. New strategies to prevent OA and repair damaged cartilage are urgently needed. Could new molecules stimulate cartilage regrowth? Could stem cell grafts be used to repair damaged cartilage? And there are some encouraging results. One is the platelet-rich plasma injections. Only problem is that despite its popularity with some high-profile athletes, PRP injections still are not proven. Mesenchymal stem cells usually we give in the form of bone marrow aspirate. The bone marrow aspirate concentrate given to the knee joint intra-articularly and it is given in the hope that it will give rise to a new cartilage. So advantage is bone marrow spirit is easier to obtain and it contains substances involved in promoting cartilage regrowth. There can be, can be autologous cultured chondrocytes and it involves collecting the cells that form cartilage from the patient's own joints, growing the cells in a laboratory and then injecting these cells in the knee. There are more new developments. One is Dr. Hiroshi Yashara and Dr. Shigeru Miyaki. They discovered that a natural molecule in the body counters the progression of the osteoarthritis and they call it microRNA 140. This microRNA 140 acts against arthritis progression and it occurs naturally in the body. So its side effects is minimal. There is one more research from the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego and they found a molecule called FOXO and they found that this FOXO are key for the joint health. By boosting the levels of this FOXO proteins, it is possible to treat osteoarthritis or even stop the disease from developing. And the absence of FOXO proteins in the joint cartilage leads to an increase in inflammation and a decrease in autophagy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead with the video a few times. I'm sure you will be competent to answer all the questions put forth by the externals and the internals in the examination.